Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's Adam Smith Institute event. My name is Tom Flockerty. I'm the executive director of the Institute. Um, and it's really great to see so many of you here this evening. I was told, I was assured that doing an event on the 15th of December, uh, no one will come. There's, there's so much else to do in December, and besides, everyone wants to go off on holiday anyway. I said, no, 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 don't be silly. If we pick a really cheerful theme, they'll all turn up. <laughs> and you know what? That's the funny thing. I thought, I'm a bit of a miserable git, but I thought 2012, the end of the world as we know it, is optimistic. Because the world at the moment isn't that great. The end of the world as we know it, notice the question mark, the world could end and something much better could come after it. Well, anyway, I doubt that that's going to be the general tone of our speeches <laughs> this evening. Although I will raise the possibility that, you know, we could have a libertarian president in the United States. We could have Arab countries come out of their spring into, and turn into real liberal democracy. So there, there are good things, but then also there's, there's the economy and all that stuff. Our format this evening. We've got four speakers. You can probably see them standing next to me, sitting next to me. Um, one after the other, they're going to come up here and talk for about 10 minutes. We're going to have Douglas Carswell first, Jamie White second, Brendan O'Neill third, and Alex Matthew fourth. Uh, to save time, I'm going to introduce them all briefly now, and then we can just run through them one after the other. Uh, so our first speaker will be Douglas Carswell. He's the Conservative Member of Parliament for Clacton. He's the co-founder of the Direct Democracy Movement in the UK, co-author of the bestseller The Plan, 12 Months to Renew Britain. He's one of the ASI's favourite politicians, and believe me, we don't have many. And he's going to be talking about the economy, Europe, and the internet. Second, Jamie White, philosopher turned financial consultant. That's by day, by night. He, well, I don't know, that night. <laughs> Sounds better that way. Senior fellow at the Cobden Centre, weekly columnist for City AM, and the star of Radio 4 programmes like Yo Hayek and Hayek versus Keynes. You can probably guess the theme there. He's talking about predation and revolution. Third, Brendan O'Neill, editor of Spiked Online. Melanie Phillips calls him exceptionally ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Tatchell calls him a smug shite. <laughs> we like to say he's by far and away our favourite Marxist, and he's going to be aiming his remarks squarely at me, talking about the tyranny of middle-class miserabilism. Finally, Alex Massey, a freelance journalist, writes a brilliant blog for The Spectator, uh, but perhaps most germane to tonight's remarks was in DC for five years as a correspondent for The Telegraph and The Scotsman, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the Ron Paul Revolution and what we can expect the other side of the pond. So, more than enough from me, I think. Over to Douglas, 10 minutes starting now. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll try and cheer you up by saying that um, I, I don't think uh, 2012 is going to be the end of the world as, as we know it, but I think it's in many ways going to be quite a, quite a miserable year. I think it's um, going to be a lot of things are going to get a lot worse. That's the bad news. Um, the good news is I, I'm medium-term and long-term very, very optimistic. In fact, long-term, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, I'm, I'm, I'm euphoric. I think we are going to see uh, profound changes to the West's political economy. As a libertarian, I think the facts of life are going to become increasingly randian. And um, I think that it's um, the end of the road for big government for big politicians telling us how to lead our lives, and I want to explain why I think that. First of all, the economy. This is going to be a prevailing theme during the course of the next 12 months, and it's going to be a prevailing theme because the Western economy is in a mess. I don't think it's just the Western economy that's precarious. I think we could see in countries like China, um, there's all sorts of problems to do with municipal debt. I think we could see a far more profound uh, global economic problem. But I think um, from a Western perspective, we are in a really bad place. And I think the reason why we're in a really bad place is because the people in the West who make these decisions believe that you can engineer growth, and it has been pretty catastrophic. They have tried to use a, a, a fiscal stimulus, a form of sort of debauched Keynesianism, um, particularly in America, but to some extent on this side of the Atlantic, to try to engineer growth. Um, and it has been catastrophic and disastrous and has landed us with huge amounts of debt. But it's worse than that. I think there's also a sort of debauched monetarism that for 40 years has been, uh, uh, basically landed us where we are. We've had um, bankers and treasury officials all agree that you can stimulate economic growth by, um, by, by, by creating artificial credit. And I think that this has led to chronic 
and catastrophic malinvestment. There has not been a, the necessary correction. And I think um, uh, this intellectual as much as financial bankruptcy of the Western elites means that um, much that's been done since 2008 has made the problem worse. Um, and, and you know you can't cure someone by giving a patient more of what made them ill. Um, I think we are going to see over the next 12 months some more people begin to question the future of, of fiat currencies and of this sort of uh, uh, stupid, foolish Western consensus. <laughs> but medium term and long term, I'm I'm gladdened by this because I think we, we 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 need some profound change. I think we need the state to begin to live within its own tax base. I think we're going to increasingly see the tax base become more mobile. Um, I think it was Louis XV's um, or XVI's um, Treasury Minister who described the art of taxation as the art of plucking feathers from a geese with a minimum amount of hissing. Well, in the age of the internet, more and more of those geese can fly away. They're not standing in line waiting to be uh, uh, have the feathers plucked from them. So um, I, I, I think um, beyond this year, in the sort of medium to long term, we're going to see, um, it's almost a question of which Western state is going to have to do some pretty dramatic things, such as... Uh, perhaps you know, abolish corporation tax or shift the burden of taxation away from taxation on productive activities and onto consumption and property as it used to be when the West was in the ascendancy. Another thing that's going to be a, a running theme is, is the question of Europe. I'm not going to go on about Europe. I, I don't like banging on about Europe. Um, but um, again, short term, I'm very pessimistic. But for that reason, I'm very medium to long term optimistic. I think we're going to see a catastrophic failure of attempts by European elites to organise the affairs of a continent of millions of people by grand design. Um, I don't want to be too sort of Englishly empirical about it and say just because it doesn't work they're not going to keep trying. They will test to destruction the idea that you can organise a continent by grand design and they will destroy millions of lives in, in, in doing so. But I, I think that um, beyond the next few years we can begin to see a, a new Europe emerging where we don't have um, these parasites. Um, first, you know, it was priests um, then it was princes, and, and now it's politicians, wrecking the lives of millions of Europeans. Finally, I think a theme that's going to be really important in, in the next year or two is, is the impact of the internet. We tend, it's said, to underestimate the impact of technology in the short term and overestimate it in the long term. Have I got that right? Sorry, we tend to overestimate it in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. I, I think that's wrong. I think in the short term, we got a lot of our analysis about the internet completely wrong. We talked about its impact on productivity, about a new paradigm. I think that was wrong. I think we're going to start to see some of the longer term <coughs> trends that the internet um, brings about, some of the changes it brings about. It's going to lead to a massive repersonalization of politics. A hundred years ago, um, almost to the month, there was a, an election in my uh, part of Essex. The incumbent uh, won with um, five and a half thousand votes. That meant people were voting for a person rather than the party. For the best part of a century, we've had generic mass brand politics, which has mean, meant that our lawmakers and legislators are no longer properly accountable to the people. The internet allows uh, direct accountability and, and, if not intimacy, certainly uh, it allows the repersonalization of politics. This is going to be a, a, a powerful theme. Um, it's going to allow the personalization of public services in a way that has never been uh, dreamt of, well, in government. Think tanks have been dreaming about it, but it's going to allow the repersonalization of, uh, or, or the personalization of public services. We're no longer going to have to put up with generic mass brand public services handed on to, uh, to us on a plate or, or, or not by the state. It's going to lead increasingly to the rise of the citizen consumer. Um, um, if politics in the past century was dominated by the um, organized labor interest, I think we're going to see politics um, and the political economy captured by the citizen consumer interest. Um, I was looking at the British Social Attitude Survey and looking at some of the trends in, in that, and I think um, many of the commentators missed the significance of what's happening. We're seeing increasingly <coughs> a, a shift away from collectivist, statist, top-down attitudes towards uh, much more sort of consumer citizen attitudes, and I think this is in, in large measure a consequence of the internet and the impact that it, it has on, on, on the, 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 the center of political gravity in this country. Um, in terms of uh, what to watch at Westminster, I think there's going to be quite a lot of movement in share prices in the year ahead. Um, I, I, I'm fearful that it may be, in terms of share price, a bad year for our Chancellor. I think his share price may be a little bit lower, I'm afraid to say, in 12 months' time than it is, it is, it is today. Um, I think it will be a bad year in terms of share price for Ed Miliband. Um, in fact, he, trading may be suspended in, in, in Ed Miliband stock. Um, if I was a young, labour, ambitious, uh, careerist politician, and I'm neither of those things, then I would be buying shares in Yvette Cooper. Um, I think it may be a, a good year for shares in her. 
but um, you know, overall, I'm 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 very um, long-term optimistic, regardless of whichever lot, whichever tribe, whatever colour rosette they wear, regardless of whichever ones are, are, are in office. I think uh, this economic downturn and the internet are going to mean that we're going to have a much more consumerist society. And in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I think we can be really optimistic because people will be able to sit in a room like this and, frankly, it won't really matter what um, the collectivists that we vote for um, on, on ballot papers decide we're going to have. We'll be able to decide it for ourselves. So it's going to be a bad year, but it's going to be uh, like going through a tunnel. There's light at the other end. Thank you. Uh, I'm not so optimistic for the long term. Uh, and the reason I'm not as optimistic as Douglas is that I don't see uh, the predicament we're in and the outcomes that are likely to arise from a resolution of it as being, I don't think it comes from an intellectual mistake. I think it's a structural problem and the structure that creates the problem isn't going to go away, which is why I'm pessimistic. Now, what is that structural problem? Well, it's universal suffrage. It's one man, one vote. If you have one man, one vote, uh, you are immediately going, not immediately, it takes a little while, it took about 50 years, you're going to get redistribution of wealth. And for a very simple reason, that although each person has an equal vote, not everybody has an equal income. <coughs> In fact, the average income is much higher than the median income. That's to say, incomes are capped are bound basically to zero at one end, at the lower end, and then they go up to just about anything, which means that most people earn less than the average. And given that that's true, here's a very good uh, proposition for a politician. You say to the public, vote for me, and I will take money off other people and give it to you. Now, that can be electorally successful because you can take from a minority and give to a majority, and so you get elected. Uh, I, I won't elaborate, that's pretty obvious. Of course, that's putting it simply, it's a lot more complicated than that. There are little vested interest groups, there are lobbies and so on, and so it doesn't always work out exactly like that. Bankers have done very well out of this kind of a system, but by and large, you're going to have a hard time as a politician if you don't pursue some kind of redistributive uh, policy. So what you get in a democracy is really what you get in all systems of human life, which is some people preying on other people. You've got predators and the prey. But interestingly, in a democracy, uh, you've got... Uh, it, it's not really the most rich and powerful who are the predators. It's the less well-off who are the predators and the better-off who are the prey. And this creates a rather stable situation. So think of where we are now. Think who in society falls into the two camps. I, I would say that the predators, I mean, the politicians are clearly, in a certain sense, the predators. They're the ones who put you in prison if you don't pay your taxes and so on, arrange for that to happen. But the beneficiaries of the predation, I'll call them the predators, after all, they vote for it and so on. The, the predators are low-income people who work. They consume far more than they produce. Uh, the unemployed, you know, people are purely living off benefits and probably bankers and highly paid government officials. The prey are entrepreneurs outside of the financial sector, high paid salary people. So the, now, think of those two groups. <clears throat> How are you going to get a revolution or something? You know, because we think something's going to really radically change here. Well, it's not going to ra radically change. Because take the group of people who are the prey, what can they do about the situation? There aren't enough of them to change it through the democratic process. And they're not going to, uh, they're not going to have a revolution. They don't want to, you know, they, they're doing all right in the current system, and they would do very badly if order broke down. So they are, they are not likely to cause trouble. They can leave. That's true. So they can, and they can become despondent. They can stop working and they can go to Hong Kong. But that's a lot harder than you may think. It's quite expensive to change country. You've got to start a whole new life. And then when you get to this other country, in many cases, you find that they've got a similar system there. After all, they tend to be democracies nowadays. And so you're going to get 
you're going to get preyed upon there as well. Uh, <clears throat> also, the situation for these people is structurally, you are kind of structurally protected. Because if you were to go to the old-fashioned kind of uh, predation, if you're a slave owner, it's very important not to overwork the slave. And if you overwork the slave, they die, or their productivity goes down because they're not healthy enough. So under the kind of system we have, there is a natural upper limit to the predation. When you get to the point where you really can't squeeze any more out of certain sectors of society, you've got to back off, right, because you're going to kill them. And that's roughly how I would interpret what's going on now, where the state has grown up to a point where if they push any further, they just can't, the buying votes with this kind of stuff, they can't go any further. And so the cuts are an attempt to just back off from the brink. And they are backing off from the brink. So you know as a member of the preyed upon class that it'll never get too bad provided the politicians are basically rational, which I think they are even in Labour. Even the Labour Party politicians don't, you know, they say, oh, we wouldn't cut so fast, but we would cut. They understand. They can't kill, sorry, they can't kill the slaves. So that's, the, the revolution isn't going to be created by the preyed upon class. Now take everybody else. They are unhappy at the moment. There's a lot of complaint. You know, some of them are occupying uh, Wall Street or occupying St. Paul's Cathedral. But I think that there's no real worry from that sector either because at some level they kind of know that they're the beneficiaries of this system. They don't, know, they don't want to really wreck it. Uh, and I think the other reason there's nothing to worry about is that they really are a bunch of pansies. I mean, the, look at them. They're kind of trustafarians there in their tents. And they're, they're not angry kind of people are going to smash the system. They're just, they're soft. Uh, and that kind of softness is exactly what you would expect the beneficiaries of the system to be. Uh, de Tocqueville pointed this out, I think, what, 150 years ago. Uh, so I don't see any serious chance of anything really profound changing. I think what's going to happen is the current <coughs> agenda, which is to just back away, we've got this natural force of democracy which increases redistribution, all the way up to a point where suddenly you find that the system is breaking down under its own weight. And then a rational politician, a rational democratic politician, backs off at that point. This happened in you know, 1979 with Thatcher. We've gone to that point, they're backed off, and you know, the bit of growth. Is... And so I, I think we're stuck in a kind of perpetual uh, so long as we have basic one man, one vote democracy, which I guess we're going to keep, we're stuck in a very narrow band. You can't have too little redistribution of wealth because then you get voted out. You can't have too much because then the whole system collapses. <coughs> we're stuck in about, I don't know, 40 to 45% government spending GDP. Uh, so that is what I think will happen next year and the year after and the year after and the year after and the year after. Uh, no change in the world as we know it. Thank you. Stephen Blumey and I have. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think the uh, events of 2011 have given us a pretty good and pretty scary insight into what we can expect in 2012. And basically, what we should expect is the expansion of the tyranny of middle class miserabilism. I think we should expect the expansion and indeed the fortification of the dominant ideology of our times, which is basically the ideology of middle class moaning, a mishmash of thriftiness, low horizons, naturalism, killjoyism and illiberalism. That outlook has become increasingly influential in 2011 and will become even more so in 2012. It's been clear for a while, perhaps for as long as 10 or 15 years, that the middle classes are on the march and are, are starting to seize power across society. Everywhere you look these days, in the media and in politics, middle class values are clearly in the ascendant. And older ruling class and working class values are on the wane and are increasingly being demonised. Indeed, it's no accident that the two great hate figures of our time are toffs and chavs. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg and uh, Vicky Pollard, because both of those kinds of people are seen as an affront to the new, to the new system of middle-class, mean-spirited middle-class morality. <coughs> and middle-class miserabilism is becoming embedded in every area of life. 
You can see it in the entrenchment of the politics of environmentalism, basically the mean-spirited idea that protecting the air in parks in Hampstead should trump industrial growth in China and Asia, elsewhere in Asia. You can see it in the miserly demonization of greed and aspiration, where we're increasingly told that even the desire for more wealth and more stuff is now actually a mental illness called affluenza. Uh, you can see it in the way that a certain brand of stony-faced feminism has seeped into mainstream thinking almost unnoticed, to such an extent that over the past fortnight alone, two adverts were banned by the Advertising Standards Authority one for Lynx and one for Marks and Spencers because they were considered offensive to women. No one bats an eyelid, no one complains. It's the return of the Mary Whitehouse outlook, but dressed up in a kind of middle class miserablist uh, language. And you can see the uh, rise of middle class miserabl miserablism in the way that even the Occupy movement, made up of the most deracinated sections of the petty bourgeoisie, is formed over by everyone from Barack Obama to Ed Miliband. And every serious journalist also feels the need to bow and scrape before this infinitesimally small group of middle class moaners. And if you visit the Occupy camp outside St. Paul's Cathedral, what you realize is that it's basically just a litany of middle class miserablist arguments. Arguments against economic growth, arguments against the idiots who make up the rat race trudging to work every morning past St. Paul's Cathedral, don't these stupid people know that there are better things to do than work nine to five? Arguments against bankers for being evil and rich, and against consumers for being stupid and for wanting to be rich. The ease with which the Occupy movement can flip between attacking the rich and attacking ordinary consumers really reveals that kind of middle class miserablist heart to their arguments. Basically, they're against the idea of wealth in general. Basically, they're against the upper classes and the lower classes the Jacob Rees Moggs and the Vicky Pollards. And you can see the rise of middle class miserabilism in the way that fox hunting was eliminated 10 years ago and the way that the news of the world was eliminated this year. They announced their arrival by doing away with a sporting institution of the upper classes and they've upped their ante by destroying a media institution <coughs> of the working classes. They're nothing if not ambitious. Hundreds of families may have enjoyed fox hunting Seven million people every Sunday may have read the news of the world, but that doesn't matter. Uh, these two institutions were offensive to the increasingly influential middle class miserablists, and therefore they had to be destroyed. It's worth asking who is safe in that kind of climate, when things as old and established and as unpopular as fox hunting and the news of the world can be done away with, and no one even really sheds a tear for them. I think it's important to ask ourselves why there is this rise of the middle class, and particularly of a certain miserablest form of middle class activist. You know, if you read the Telegraph or the Mail, you could be forgiven for thinking that there is a conspiracy of guardianistas who all meet in some cafe in Hampstead and plot to rule, ruin our fun and spoil our lives and make life miserable for the rest of us, which is obviously a fantasy. Middle class miserablism is in the ascendancy by default, not by design. It is predicated on the collapse of the two great classes of old, the capitalist class and the working class, broadly speaking, the right and the left. It is the historic immolation of those two classes over the past two decades which has set the stage for the emergence of that third, traditionally ignored, ever so slightly annoying class, uh, the middle class. It's the emptying out of the old historic clash between the capitalist class and the working class, which defined politics for the past 200 years, which creates the space for the emergence of this third class and explains why it has become so extraordinarily influential in politics, media, and society over the past 10 to 15 years. So if you look at the capitalist class, for example, they are a shadow of their <coughs> former selves. They're a laughing stock, even to a Marxist like me. If you read the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels, they heap praise upon the original uh, capitalist class, on the radical bourgeoisie who wanted to remake society. They heap praise upon them for what they built, for what they did, for their transformation of the globe. They wouldn't recognize the capitalist class we have today, which is uh, completely risk-averse, uh, meek, 
doesn't even really believe in the free market anymore, certainly doesn't believe in massive manufacturing or uh, building new infrastructure, but is simply this kind of meek uh, uh, capitalist class which is influenced in many ways by the ideas of the Occupy movement itself. Just look at something like the Tory party, which wants the kind of embodiment of that old uh, upper ruling class. Today, uh, you know, the most hilarious criticism that people make of the Tory party is to say that Cameron's new conservatives are really just Thatcher in disguise. They are the old free marketeers uh, just pretending to be nice and touchy-feely and everything else. That is complete nonsense. Uh, the contemporary Tory party has nothing in common with Thatcher at all. It's basically just new labour on steroids. It's uh, resurrected, it keeps up New Labour's nannying, except it calls it nudging instead. It keeps up New Labour's interference in everyday families. We saw that today with the launch of that bizarre campaign to correct 120,000 so-called problem, problem families. It's obsessed with lifestyle, telling us what to eat. If you look at something like Ian Duncan Smith's increasingly creepy poverty uh, institution, it's all about measuring the sides of, sizes of working class people's brains, trying to work out why they're such bad parents, trying to prevent children from being walked forever before the age of three. Basically, we have the return of New Labour values dressed up as a Conservative Party, but it's not a Conservative Party at all. The lack of a moral anchor, the lack of any po political depth to the modern Tory party means that even that old establishment institution has been quite easily invaded by the values of the middle class miserablists. And then if we look at the working class institutions of old, trade unions are a joke, the left has completely abandoned any commitment to growth in favour of calling for everyone to rein in and tighten their belts and save the planet and so on. Uh, and the working classes only feature in public debate now as either a threat to the social order or as victims, as either violent chavs or beaten women who need the help of the middle class miserablest industry to put them on the straight and narrow. So it is the hollowing out of those traditional, the two classes around which politics was based for 200 or more years, it's the hollowing out of those classes which has allowed the rise of this rather intemperate, uh, illiberal, middle class, miserablest section of society. And I think we are going to see them become ever more influential next year unless we decide to do something about it. The thing to bear in mind about the rise of these middle class miserablists is that their outlook on life, their political <coughs> creed, doesn't have any real roots in tradition as the old conservative outlook used to have, and it doesn't have any real roots in ordinary people's lives as the old uh, politics of the working classes had. It's a very fleeting, flimsy, weak outlook, which is only strong now because of the weakness of alternatives and because of the weakness of the old idea that we should grow society and create a better world and make more stuff, not less. So I think in 2012, one thing worth thinking about is having a union of toffs and chabs, a union of the old upper classes who are still committed to conservative values and are still interested in growth, with working class people who still want to have better, more fulfilling, more stuff-filled lives. If we can bring those two sections of society together, then we might have a chance of doing away with the middle class miserablists who have been dominant in our lives for the past 10 years. Alex Massey. Well, this is all very cheery stuff, isn't it? Uh, let me um, try and bring in together some of the things that have been um, said already this evening while also talking about uh, what we might expect in the United States next, e next year. Um, when I consider the Republican race for the uh, uh, privilege of challenging Barack Obama next year, I'm, I can't avoid thinking of um, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, macabre short story, The Pit and the Pendulum, <coughs> in which, as you'll know, being an erudite bunch, the protagonist, victim, if you like, is strapped horizontal and beneath this sort of swinging scythe or axe that with every swing gets lower and lower and lower. And he realizes rather to his understandable horror that eventually it is going to slice him open, slice open his chest and kill him. I feel rather like that 
with each passing day as you turn one page of the calendar to the next and the horrible realization dawns upon you that one of these people is actually going to win the Republican nomination. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, carnival of grotesques that have uh, emerged from some primordial uh, uh, conservative swamp uh, to challenge uh, Obama. Uh, one imagines uh, a bunch of demented barkers uh, attracting passing trade, perhaps with the aid of Fox <coughs> News, uh, the Weekly Standard, uh, Newsmax, and Donald Trump. Uh, and various other ne'er-do-wells, each of them imploring you to roll up, roll up, uh, pay your money, takes your choice of our lunatic pygmies. Uh, you know, wonder, watch them dance, see how they talk, wonder where they came from, despair at what it all means. Um, it is an astonishing thought when one considers that Mitt Romney, whom nobody likes, uh, including Mitt Romney's own supporters, uh, is still, by some distance, the most probable Republican nominee. Uh, he is the John Kerry of 2012, the man for whom they will eventually settle, having flirted with various more attractive, but somewhat, see uh, somewhat unseemly, even sordid alternatives. Uh, we had uh, Michelle Bachmann's uh, turn in the sun, of which uh, uh, decency demands we say no more. Uh, we had Herman Cain's turn in the sun, of which, again, <laughs> decency demands we draw a veil over that particular embarrassment. And now it's Newt Gingrich, uh, who is supposed to be the saviour of uh, uh, not just American conservatism, but uh, the United States itself. Uh, uh, Gingrich uh, uh, an extraordinary fellow, um, a man of big ideas uh, and uh, small results. Uh, he's been called quite ap aptly, I think, a stupid person's idea of a clever person. <laughs> uh, this is a phrase, actually, that I think is at least 80 years old, and initially, uh, the first I know of it uh, appearing was in the, in the pages of The Spectator, actually, uh, when Elizabeth Bowen was um, writing about um, Aldous Huxley, of all people, uh, and she, too, she considered him a, a stupid person's idea of a clever person. Um, uh, Gingrich is a man who thinks we should uh, mine the moon, colonize Mars, and most improbably of all, says, I'm like Thatcher and Churchill. Um, uh, in these circumstances, it is easy to despair, and uh, I wouldn't blame you for doing so. Uh, and yet, in one, in one sense, there are small measure, reasons for hope when one considers the state of the Republican Party at the moment. Uh, it is interesting to see how Ron Paul, a man dismissed as a fringe act uh, four years ago and, can, and still dismissed as such in many respects today, uh, actually has a chance of performing well in Iowa. Uh, Nate Silver, the number crunching guru at the New York Times, gives him a 20 to 25 percent chance of winning Iowa. Now, this in itself does ne not necessarily mean an awful lot. I mean, Iowa has voted for Pat Buchanan before. Um, but nevertheless, the one thing one can say about Paul is that he is a transparently honest man, which in the state of the present Republican Party, a party made up of uh, plutocrats, Puritans, and scolds uh, in many respects, uh, is an honesty, a fundamental decency, whether you agree with him on everything or not, and <coughs> most people do not agree with him on everything, and most people actually don't agree with him on anything. But uh, nevertheless, Paul's transparent honesty, his decency, uh, is something that uh, uh, speaks to something I think that Douglas was speaking about earlier in terms of voting for an individual rather than for a machine, R voting for uh, someone who stands for something, whether you agree with all of that or not. Uh, it's true that, you know, Paul has his kookier moments. There are occasions when he sort of reminds you of, uh, you know, your slightly eccentric uncle who corners you at a family gathering and so on to tell you about the progress he is making with his, uh, I don't know, his, his parsnip-powered chicken-plucking machine or something. Um, nevertheless, Paul's 
tapped into something in the American consciousness. You know, that the, Ameri the, the federal government has got too large, uh, is trying to do too much. Uh, and he is the only remaining candidate in the Republican field uh, who has this view. When you watch their debates, you see Romney and Gingrich and Perry, <laughs> who's a Texas corporatist, of course, uh, each of them saying that, well, of course I can deliver economic growth when President Obama has failed. Of course, I have the answers to unlocking American uh, industry, American entrepreneurial activity, American, uh, uh, the American spirit, if you like. Um, and all of it is, of course, baloney. Each of them take a profoundly unconservative approach to these things. Each of them are, in their own different ways, uh, big staters. Uh, each of them, in their own ways, are exactly more of the same. Uh, the difference between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama is vastly smaller than the difference between Mitt Romney and Ron Paul. And yet Romney will, in the end, actually prevail in this contest. Uh, it is a disappointment, perhaps, nevertheless. Uh, the uh, Republican electorate will, after New Hampshire, after Iowa and New Hampshire, I think, there is a, there's about a five-week gap before Super Tuesday, uh, which means that so long as Romney remains alive after New Hampshire, uh, uh, which I think it, one has to concede is probable, um, uh, he will be well-placed to prevail uh, in as much as anyone who is in a position to challenge him will implode like some sort of exploding Death Star uh, well before then. Uh, Brendan's talked about middle class miserablism and so on, and as though the middle class is somehow uh, the, responsible for everything that ails us. But the Republican Party at the moment is, uh, of course, in, in, amongst its paeans of praise to uh, middle class virtues and all the rest of it and so on, because of course in the United States everybody is middle class, um, including 200 million pound, uh, 200 million dollar Romney. Um, uh, he's still a regular. Uh, middle class fellow, uh, everybody, the, the Republican Party is this sort of union of the, of the super rich and at the same time the disadvantaged uh, white non-college educated working class. Um, uh, and yet it has a magnificently, or appallingly I mean, uh, puritanical streak to it. Uh, nothing symbolizes this so much as the, the uh, fact that Rick Santorum has been given places in every debate uh, that's been held this year. You know, Santorum, the man who is perhaps most famous, or at least this is the, the only thing one, anyone need know about Rick Santorum, uh, is that he's a man whose views on gay marriage are that uh, gay marriage, that is, allowing people who love one another to marry one another, uh, will inevitably lead to something called, and I quote, Man on dog action. <laughs> uh, 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 this is a man who's been included as a as a representative, credible, sensible, worthy of respect voice in the uh, Republican Party. He's been included in the GOP debates at the expense of the former governor of New Mexico, Jack Gary Johnson, uh, two-term governor of New Mexico, multiple a veto over of. 700 pieces of doubtless crackpot legislation, uh, fire of public servants, uh, or government or taxpayer paid employees, I mean. Uh, uh, in, and, and yet Santorum is a more credible, more worthy voice in the modern Republican Party than a, a candidate who thinks that the war on drugs is not just wrong uh, and unwinnable, or it's not just unwinnable, but is wrong. Uh, there is one small glimmer of hope on the Gary Johnson front. I, I understand that there's talks that uh, possibly as soon as Tuesday he is um, uh, going to announce that having been left by the Republican Party, uh, he is going to join the Libertarian Party and will be well placed to take their nomination for the presidency. Uh, in which case I would um, advocate a vote for him uh, on the grounds that uh, Ron Paul lovable though he is, and while he may shock the world in Iowa, um, is not in the end, I'm afraid, likely to win the Republican nomination. Uh, as I say, I think that it will, that will revert to Romney, who is in very, very many ways the establishment candidate, uh, candidate of, uh, the, uh, of the Beltway, 
candidate of the status quo in many respects. Um, and Romney, uh, while being more electable than Gingrich or any of his uh, or any of the other contenders, is still in the end, I'm afraid, not likely to win the presidency. Which means that 2012 um, may not be the end of the world as we know it. Um, if for the very good reason that I think it, mean, it is likely to end with four more years of President Barack Obama.